All seems to be a bit scanty, and pressure is due to the rain. And maybe the next 20 minutes it will, it will feel to the break. But we don't like to delay it here again. We can start this program with the national team of our great country, Nigeria.
down to the hand of the Lord. I would like to call on our immediate past president, Professor Shekla, if you're allowed to commit this program to the hand of the Lord, sir. Eternal of Faithes, our dear Father in Tegu, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity once again for us to be here as Saturdays of Bankers of Nigeria, as leaders of thought in the Nigerian economy, to once again deliberate upon issues that will move our country forward. We commit everything unto your hand, our dear Father. Take absolute control of all the proceedings today in Jesus' name. We pray for those that are on their way here. Lord be with them so that they join us with you in Jesus' name. At the end of today's proceedings, Lord, give us every capacity to walk the talk, to implement all the noble, lovely ideas that we have managed from these discussions today, so that we will be able to move our nation to the next level. We commit once again the leadership of CIDN on your hands. They need wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to do the need to, so that our great institutes will continue to contribute to the Nigerian state. We thank you, our dear Father, for answer prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, our new president and chairman of council. While we remain we, we just seated, I would like to recognize those in the auditorium. If I start to this side of the table, I'd like to propose to recognize the past president of this great institute, Mazi OCK Ibegu, FCIB, we are most welcome son. Also, the man that has been Reverend Father, that has just delivered his speech, our immediate past president, Professor Shenmu Ajibola, FCIB. <laughs> Next to him is the National Treasurer of the Institute, Professor Oban Rewaju Pires. We have FCIB, we have most of the sir. There are four of the team that manage the Institute. We have the Vice President and the second Vice President. They should be joining us very soon. Once again, everyone is very important to see again. You are highly welcome to the Bankers House. On my side, I'd like to start with the Registrar and Chief Executive of the Institute, Mr. Sheria Wendobi, FCIB. Next to him is the representative of the Acting Director General of National Pension Commission, Mr. Ibrahim Kandiwa, and the President of Kenya. You are most welcome, sir. Next to Mr. Ibrahim is no other person than the man that has seen it all in infrastructural development. No other person than Engineer Maso Ahmed. FNS, EDS, FNI, Security Director, Dangote B, and President and Vice Official of the Union. I will skip to three minutes. I'll go to the far end. The far end is the person that actually coined this particular. an impromptu, you don't call him an impromptu person, because he, he saw our advert when we sent an invite to him, and he felt he just need to be part of this great event. He's no other person than the ambassador from the High Commission of the Federal Republic of Namibia to Nigeria, Ambassador Joseph. <laughs> Next to him is how to believe he should be a man of no introduction, which I want to be to believe that is one of the persons that actually made this a lot of people to be asking that they need to come to this occasion. I want to believe you know the person I'm talking about. 
Am I getting your buy-in? Yes. Who is the person, please? He's not that person, but the man we call by company. The day calls him by the express road man. Please join me to welcome Dr. Wale Babalaki. Thank you very much. Next to him is the chairman of this great occasion, Mr. Andrew Ali, Group CEO Partner Southwick Group. The person we are all getting here for, the guest speaker of this occasion, is no other person from, but Professor Melvin Ayogu, a member of the Institute to be ACI. We are both welcome, sir. They always say the, magic, the masculine to take the pace of everything. The person that brought us. Without wasting much of our time and while we are anticipating attendance of. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I stand on existing protocol already observed. Good afternoon. When we want to select this topic at the committee level, research strategy and advocacy committee, we deliberated on so many issues and challenges that this country is facing. But out of all those issues, we unanimously agreed that this topic we are going to discuss today, infrastructure development and growth in Nigeria, prospects and challenges remains one of the most critical issues facing the country today. And when we presented it at the Governing Council of the Institute, again it was unanimously agreed that the topic is actually very critical, the issue is very critical, and the recommendations that will come out of this session will have a significant positive impact on the country. Now, also it, is not a also, it is not a coincidence, it is not a coincidence that we have this high caliber of people leading this session today. It is actually deliberate that we selected this caliber of people to come and lead today's session. From the chairman of the session to the guest speaker, to the members of the panel, we're looking at people with tremendous experience, people with exceptional track record, and people with strong core competencies in the area we're going to discuss today. For me, I just want to basically provide some high-level remarks and thought-provoking comments that I believe will jumpstart our detailed discussions for the session. If you look at the search, Extensive research has been done, and it's, it's been proven that there's a direct correlation between the level of infrastructure and economic growth. In fact, it, it has been further proven that there is a two-way relationship between the two, defined in terms of what they call the forward linkage and the backward linkage. In terms of the forward linkage, it's been proven that 1% growth in infrastructure should result in a corresponding 1% growth in the per capita GDP of a country. Then if you look at it from the perspective of backward, backward linkage, it has also been proven that infrastructure, when there is growth in infrastructure, that leads to the growth in GDP. The growth in GDP also engenders better infrastructure. And that explains why if you look at different countries in the world, low-income countries, middle-income countries, high-income countries, as we go, as we trend up, we discover that the level of infrastructure continues to become more sophisticated. So at the low-income level, you have basic infrastructure requirements. As we move to the middle-income, you have more sophisticated infrastructure requirements. And as we go to the high-income countries, we actually have really sophisticated infrastructure requirements. So while infrastructure development 
engenders growth. Growth also drives, from a backward perspective, infrastructure development. And if you look at the case of Nigeria, you take Nigeria as a typical case study. Let me just quickly run through some statistics for one minute. Look at what has happened in Nigeria between 2016 and 2019 in terms of our GDP growth. Of course, we are aware in 2016 we had recession. In, we got out of recession in 2017. In 2017, we had what, what I would call like a taper GDP growth of around 0.8%. In 2018, it grew, grew from 0.8% to 1.83% GDP. And in the first quarter of 2019, we've seen a growth of around 2.01%. And it is projected that the annual growth for 2019, GDP growth for 2019 Nigeria, will be around 2%. IMF projected that. The World Bank is less bullish than IMF. They believe that it's going to be less than 2%. What is the common factor, denomination that we have found across these three, three years? And even before 2016, again, we are proving that a major challenge that this country has is a relatively low level of infrastructure development in the country. So it's a major, major challenge that we have in the country. It is also interesting to know that not only does infrastructure development to go good, it also results in eradication of poverty. Last week, our president made a bold vision statement, June 12th. He said he wants 100 million Nigerians to be taken out of poverty in the next decade. But there's some historical precedent to that. If you look at some countries, China, Indonesia, even with autocratic regimes, they were able to achieve massive reduction in poverty. In fact, for the case of China, China took about 800 million people out of poverty in the 70s, and they're still planning over the next one year to take an additional 5 million people out of poverty. If you look at India, India is the largest democracy that we know. And more importantly, India presents a, a fairly similar demographic structure like Nigeria. India has also been able to achieve likely taking people, a lot of their people out of poverty. And one of the major reasons, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi won re-election was because of the fact that he is perceived to have taken people out of poverty. So today, we, we, we are talking about the topic, about the realization of the vision of the president. So, we believe that the vision is realizable, but we have to be strategic, we have to be methodical, and we have to be very deliberate about it. I have very much confidence in the ability of our guest speaker today, supported by the panelists, and of course, moderated by a chairman, to come up with recommendations that was very useful to this country. I look forward to a participating and interesting session I have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like Sydney judges of the President and Chairman of Council, the Chinese of, of Nigeria, Dr. Uche Besaya Oluwu, FCIB, to give his welcome first. Thank you, Mr. Akira. Uh, the National Treasurer of our Great Institute, Professor Keji Olario Waji of CID, uh, the Registrar Chief Executive of our Great Institute, Mr. Shea Awojobi, our past presidency are present. Um, MD of FSDH here, and our power set of Digital Finance League of the Our uh, members on the top table, our chair, um, our guest speaker, our members on the top table. Um, I welcome you all this afternoon. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is with immense pleasure that I welcome you to the 2019 edition of the annual lecture of the Chinese of Bankers of Nigeria. Uh, one of our platforms for public policy advocacy and enlightenment program which focuses on contemporary issues of interest in the Nigerian banking industry and nation economy as a whole. The lecture as usual for is to be interesting, engaging and enlightening. This is evident 
in this year's team title, Infrastructure Development and Growth in Nigeria, Prospects and Challenges. This is actually a rare, rare honor and privilege to be the East of Banking and Finance Professionals, Diplomats, Academicians, Captains of the Industry, Regulators and Operators in the Financial Services Value Chain, as well as all the relevant stakeholders in Nigeria and government. I appreciate your making our time to attend yet another thought-provoking lecture is to, uh, in spite of the rains that you are here, your presence is indeed a testimonial of your continuous support for the Institute's activities and the foundation of how much you hold this event in high esteem. The importance of adequate and reliable infrastructure cannot be underestimated as the agendas and supports economic growth and development. Indeed, reliable infrastructure is essential to sustainable economic development and competitiveness. Investment in the nation's infrastructure has been this far. Nigerian core infrastructure is estimated between 20 to 35 percent of GDP, as opposed to global benchmark of 70 percent. The economic recovery and growth plan, which is infrastructure net growth strategy, is designed to bring the gap with proper and sustainable execution. In the pursuit of this viable solution to this surfacing, I humbly propose the need for further integrated regional development policies that will provide greater access to viable sectors to the Nigerian economy. Our guest speakers, ladies and gentlemen, and eminent panelists have been carefully selected in their own rights as subject matter experts, academicians, and captains of the industry. I'm optimistic that you will bring to bear the various experiences to set, shed more light on the topic and thus add value to this knowledge event. Professor Melvin Ayogo, ACI, a fellow of Mahukwe Institute of Strategic Reflections in Africa, a distinguished scholar and accomplished professional, is our guest lecturer for today's lecture. I would also like to welcome one is comprising Dr. Wale Babalaki, ACA, and Chairman of the Economy Group, and Pro Chancellor, and Chairman, Governing Council of the University of Lagos. Also, we have uh, representing Adia Aisha Dayul Omar, the Acting Director, uh, Director General of the National Pension Commission here. Also, uh, the Managing Director, uh, Engineer Mansu Ahmed, Executive Director of the Group, and Chairman of uh, manufacturing Association of Nigeria. It is also important to for me to recognize the efforts and applaud the committee of the planning, the commitment of the planning committee of the annual lecture, as well as the research strategy and advocacy committee, will be led by the chairman of chairman and council member Mr. Billy and the FCID for making this event a reality. Let me assure everyone here that this lecture is not simply a talk show. The recommendations and insights available at this gathering will be documented and modeled as a policy paper which will be circulated to the appropriate authorities and stakeholders of the economy. These distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all once more to this important event and wish you an enlightened, enlightened session. Thank you for kind attention. God bless you all. Let's appreciate our president and chairman of council. And while it was given the speech, may I recognize the presence of uh, Mrs. Amda Hamba, the MD and CEO of FSDA National Bank Limited. Also in our midst is the past registrar of the Chinese of Bankers of Nigeria, Dr. Uji Ogobuka, FCID. I would like to call on a member of the RSA Committee of the Institute, a person of Professor Franklin Ugu of Lagos Business School, to talk about the speaker before the speaker comes on board. Thank you. It's best as Thank you.
sorry, there is a slight news talk. I'm supposed to call on Chairman T.P. Newman. Please let us appreciate Dr. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Andrew Ramey. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sometime last year, I was uh, honored to be given an honorary membership of uh, this uh, august uh, institution. And I guess that this is my um, payment uh, <laughs> uh, for that. But I'm, um, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Um, because infrastructure is uh, something that I've spent probably about the last 20 years of my life, uh, one way or the other, uh, trying to uh, push across Africa. Uh, over that period, I probably uh, invested something in the region of, uh, well, over $5 billion uh, directly, uh, mainly through AFC, but also what I did with IFC. Um, now, uh, that sounds like a very large number, and it is, uh, but unfortunately, the um, African Development Bank uh, estimates that something like uh, 50 billion uh, to 70 billion per annum uh, needs to be invested across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa um, in order to catch up with infrastructure deficits. Uh, that we suffer. Now, Nigeria is a large uh, part of, um, of Sub-Saharan Africa, and those numbers uh, come to something like, um, people take $30 billion uh, per annum, uh, which um, is estimated is required to be invested in Nigeria. Now, when you look at what the government earns, in terms of revenue per annum. It's probably around the same, so I think falls in the range of 20 to 30 billion dollars. So um, the government, it, I mean, it is, it's just simply impossible uh, for the government alone to, um, to, uh, to solve this infrastructure problem. Um, and therefore, it is imperative that we get private investors uh, to do this. We have typically relied on a model uh, which um, you know, involves bringing investors in from offshore and foreign direct investment in all sectors, especially in infrastructure, is extremely uh, important. And I, I don't need to repeat the benefits of infrastructure, which we had about uh, a little bit earlier. Um, but when you look at uh, what, we, uh, what we do within Nigeria, Nigeria currently, um, and this is as a country um, as a whole, uh, so both private and public sector, Nigeria's uh, total investment as a proportion of GDP comes to roughly 15%. Now, to put this in context, um, so I'm not sure why I'm getting uh, reverberations, but to put that in context, uh, that's roughly the same as the UK. Now, obviously, when you go to the UK uh, and you look at it compared with Nigeria, you realize that perhaps they don't need quite as much investment uh, as we do. Um, we, um, uh, if you look at China, which is the other end of the spectrum, that number is 50%. And if you look at most fast-growing emerging markets, that number is sort of 30, 35%. I'm talking about the one in East Asia. Um, it, the better countries in, in Africa are in the mid to late 20s. Uh, so, it is, um, so we are, quite frankly, in, um, in Nigeria, seriously underperforming uh, what we can do in terms of uh, mobilizing domestic investment. This is actually uh, very important because 
foreign investment can really only be built on domestic investment. Um, and, and therefore, we, you know, and on the flip side, we can't just rely on uh, offshore investment. Amongst other things, it creates a massive uh, foreign exchange mismatch because ultimately, particularly when you're talking about infrastructure, uh, this is paid for in Naira. You pay your electricity bills in Naira, you pay, uh, or, or the airlines pay Mr. Babalakin's uh, fees on his uh, airport terminal in, in Naira, I think. Um, so, so we need to figure out how we can uh, mobilize more domestic investment generally, not just in infrastructure, and those numbers I gave are all investment, not just in infrastructure investment. And in that sense, it's, it's very good uh, that we have someone representing Pencom here, uh, because um, I think that those numbers that I just gave would be absolutely dire if we didn't have uh, the, the pension uh, scheme that we have, which is essentially a forced uh, savings scheme. Um, so I think that's on the one hand. Um, and, and why I say all this is that one, um, you know, there hasn't frankly been a lot of private investment into the infrastructure in the last uh, decade or so. Um, you know, there was uh, the, the, the projects that by Courtney has done, uh, there have been um, there was electricity privatization, which uh, was as far from successful as perhaps you could ever be. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's been the odd, you know, private power plant that has been built. Um, so it's really very inadequate. And um, I think that uh, when you look at that, a lot of the discussion around this focuses on um, financing. And financing is, is important, uh, but actually there's a lot more uh, that goes around it beyond the financing. And I think that those uh, aspects tend to be underlooked and underestimated in terms of their importance. The whole framework, if you take, if you take the power privatization, uh, the whole framework under which it was done uh, clearly uh, was flawed, and no amount of financing, I think, can, uh, can recover that without some sort of tweak uh, to the way the whole uh, system is run. Uh, if you are um, going to build a toll road or an airport terminal, you need to have the appropriate uh, framework in which to do it. There needs to be a lot of uh, physical preparation of the projects, and these things take long. In Africa, the average uh, time from conception to realization of a car project is well over 10 years. I mean, you know, I remember hearing about Mandela Dam, I can't remember how long ago, I'm not sure the project is even, uh, is even complete now. Um, so, so, you know, we are bankers in this institute, um, so I guess the focus is on financing. And the financing aspect is, is very important, in particular, um, the need for long-term uh, money. I mean, again, uh, as we all know, in, you know, for various reasons which I don't want to go into, um, uh, it's very hard to get anything more than you know, five, seven year money uh, you know, in terms of the term loan from a bank. If you go to the bond market, maybe you can get a bit more. But really getting anything in about 10 years if you're not a government is you know, a Herculean uh, tax, which then drives people to borrow in dollars, one of the reasons. And then they have these uh, foreign currency uh, issues. Um, so, so that is clearly a very important aspect. And, and you know, you need the money. We need the financing to be able to build this, uh, this infrastructure. I think tied with that, and, and the last point to uh, you know, different people blame different other people for why we are where we are. Uh, I'm not getting into that debate, but if you talk to somebody in a disco, they will tell you that often they're being supplied with power 
at a price they have to pay, which is more than uh, to see these things accessible uh, to everybody. And we feel that making the prices as low as possible uh, does that. Uh, but it does that in an unsustainable uh, manner. Uh, and again, you know, I, I, I don't like to overclock these parallels, but when we had um, mobile phones in this country, they, they allowed them to raise the funding to be able to invest in the networks that we all uh, enjoy today. So I think these are just some of the issues that face, um, uh, that face us as we develop uh, infrastructure. Um, we have the, His, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador, the High Commissioner, I should say, from the project, uh, for the Diplomatic Incident. Uh,
Standard Bank of West Africa, which became <laughs> Standard Bank of Nigeria, and then First Bank. And at the time, I actually started working as a junior clerk because there was no position for a clerk. Even though I had a high school form, I said, I'll do anything. So um, I got this bank, and then I started uh, taking the ACIP exam. So Rapid Resort College London. And, and after I got my ACIP, then I went back to school in the U.S. in 1980. I quit banking and then my side to the university. So when you are my age, your sleepy tends to get intimidated. It's a matter of age, you all get there. So uh, there's nothing special about it. Um, now that I spend more time in the village, and I hope I don't become my leave with because one of my friends said, and you start wearing the pretend, it's like what the other medium wears, and how about that? So I said, I think that's a deal breaker. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to go that far. But I take interest in the government at home because it's simply a microcosm of what happened at the federal level. And I think we get, as they say, after you divide in the kitchen, then you divide the central. So even the fights and those um, same transactional issues become central to the issues of investment, particularly long term investment. Now, to the substance of my thing is by nail. But infrastructure is a big elephant, and uh, it requires an integrated approach to get it right. And very often people don't realize that. And I'm hoping that our discussions uh, this uh, afternoon will open us up to the way in which you can, um, if that's due to ignorance, and all that are due to simple uncertainty, because those things permeate the area of infrastructure. There are known or not. There are also known norms and there are also personal agenda. So when they all come together, sometimes it's very difficult to understand why what is happening happening. It's also why the, the reason why context is very important. So um, what I'm going to do, there's supposed to be a presentation, but before I do that presentation, let me give you a little bit of context and infrastructure. I began to wonder why the bankers would want me to talk about infrastructure. Because if you want to understand the problem, you follow the money. The money is in the banks. So for the banks to give you the money, they ask you all kinds of questions you've ever borrowed. Write your name, your grandmother, the catechist of your church, your everybody. So they know everything about you. So if bankers lend for infrastructure, surely they know a lot about infrastructure. So my first reaction is to say what the mafia says. This is a setup. Or, <laughs> if you're a lawyer, I would say this is a trap. <laughs> Why do they want me to talk about something they already know the answer? They know what is happening. They're just pretending, and they probably know more about this than I do. Then I realized that most investment bankers, and by the way, an investment banker is a non-banker sitting in a bank. That's why they pay them a lot because they bring multidisciplinarity. If a bank is going to land in the energy sector, it has to have an engineer, someone who understands oil and gas, someone who understands aviation. If you're going to do in the aviation, if you're going to do agriculture, you need somebody in agriculture. So most of these investment bankers are technocrats, they're experts in their fields, but they sit in the bank to make sure that the banker's money is safe. So a lot of the things I knew about the engineering and physics of electricity were taught to me by investment bankers. Grid stability, intermittency, dispatchability, these are attributes that matter in considering electricity on which of the generating plants are actually more efficient. Because every generating plant is not the same. The same way in thinking about that what they're doing in a refinery, uh, which is uh, interesting that I can see the executive director here. I googled and I said, where are you going to get this power from? Because having lived in South Africa, I know that beneficiation and refinery is very power intensive. And then they talked about laying the pipe uh, on the sea, uh, submarine to, to pipe in, into the refinery to, uh, to avoid interruption. And I said, why didn't the government think about this? Uh, the Jenkos, when they are, were trying to restructure the industry. Why don't you think about the vulnerabilities in the supply chain system? And if that cannot be addressed adequately, why go ahead with the project? Why do we have ASS job? 
Okay. So, and this again goes to the integrated nature. But anyway, having asked that question, I tried to answer it for myself, I came to the conclusion that perhaps, as Mr. Ali said, maybe they want me to give it a different tag. They don't want me to talk about the technicality. They want me to talk about the organizational architecture, about the ownership structure, because these things are very important, just as important as technological aspect in making sure that it functions. In fact, varying technological uh, inseparability, transaction cost is the most important aspect of organizational software. If you don't organize things very well, and each parts don't talk to each other, it's not a part, and a lot of people don't realize that. Hence, sometimes the lawyers or the deal makers get all the money. People wonder why the paper pushers get all the money. Because if one can't talk to the other, there's not going to be any deal. So, organizational architecture, ownership structure, and control rights are very important in discussing integrated systems. If you talk to some of the people in the unfunded electricity market, for instance, they'll tell you that the Jenkins are supposed to collect the money. Sorry, the discos are supposed to collect the money, but the, and then the bulk trader is supposed to be the middle person, almost like for bankers, remember what happens in your after-day market, the interbank market, that's where you clear, because your demand is uncertain and your supply is also uncertain, the deposit and the loan demands are uncertain. Therefore, exports, at the end of the day, you will have liquidity adjustment costs. If you loan more than you have, you have to go and borrow to net your position. And if you have more money than you loan now, you would want to unload it into the market to the price of and interest. So somebody has to be there in the middle trying to maintain order in the system. In the same way in electricity, because demand is uncertain and supply is also uncertain, that's why the types of generation does matter. Somebody has to be there and you can't store electricity. So like, like one, you've got a lot of technical problems that actually require all those different segments, whether it's generation or transmission or distribution, to coordinate, otherwise the whole thing is going to fall apart. So when you turn on to the engineer, Brian right, talked about this today when he was talking about regional integration, that sometimes you're entering into an integration, there's going to be a lifetime uh, association, and then they're hurry, 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 hurry. They don't want you to be very deliberate. And yet the exit cost, once you enter, is very difficult. Um, unless, of course, it's a trap, which is what happens in the U.S. marriage. You can go to Las Vegas and get married, but try a divorce, and you see what happens to you. Okay, so, um, exit cost should influence your entry cost. If it's very tough to unbundle, and then you better think about it before you get into the business. These are some of the issues we should have in the back of our mind as we think about the infrastructure problems. Because these are cross-cutting issues regarding the details that vary across the different components of infrastructure, but it always comes down to the same thing. Now, one more thing before I go into the formal presentation. Because certain aspects of infrastructure require fixed networks to operate, and those fixed networks um, have no substitute. There's always this tension between the supplier and the demander or the buyer if you like, that if you build the network, then they become captive customers. And once you become captive customers, they screw you over, excuse my French. On the other hand, the investor is reluctant to invest because once they've invested, you've got them over the barrel. What who are you going to sell the transformers to? It's not like you can go into the machine market or a lot of the buyer transformer. It's only used for a very specific purpose. So even for a bank to petition to wind up the asset of a distribution company or a generating company, there's not much value in that asset. So you don't want to wind them down, you want them to be successful. So those kinds of investments are very risky. Yeah. And therefore, once they've trapped you into investing, they can actually mess you up. It's called post contractual opportunism. So it's almost like a game. You know, everybody's looking at everybody, 
And therefore, trust is very central in this kind of long-term relationship. And the credibility, whether it's of the government, the regulator, the investors, or even the consumers, it's a very complex interaction, and one that requires lots of thought to try to unravel that. That's just one of the takeaway things I want you to bear in mind as we discuss infrastructure. It's cross-cutting. It doesn't matter whether you're applying to water, to electricity, to telecommunications, to airport facilities, to seaport. Anything that requires long investment over a long time. And for bankers as well, the mode of finance, the structure of financing for infrastructure is very uh, unique. Because otherwise, you're going to confront the problems of balance sheet mismatch. You can't use short-term deposits to finance long-term assets. Otherwise, the amortization rate becomes so high that nobody can afford other types of investment. Okay, so given the pressure from the investors, as well as the financing institution, and the nature of the investment should be taken into account carefully before embarking on that investment. Therefore, if you do it in a knee jerk, eventually you're going to run into serious problems. And it seems like that is what has happened in certain aspects of the core infrastructure in Nigeria. So let's get started. Where is the... Uh, So um, the role, my uh, the presentation is divided into four parts. The last two is fairly easy. The first is the role of infrastructure, which is very clear. In fact, I called um, Mr. Abbas this morning, and I said, I've got an amphibious craft, and I'm, because I don't want to swim to your institute. If you drive through, I do a hope well. You either have a four by four, or you get a kayak so you can swim, or you get a railroad. So this is infrastructure in practice. I don't have to do any empirical evidence. This step across the road in your suit and um, try walking around the road and you'll find out the problem with infrastructure where it's very important. Uh, in fact, I tell people that what happens, you go to Lekki, uh, and this is why you excuse my life, why you drainage, because it just goes around your house, but it doesn't drain to anywhere. So it's not compliant, because if the architect says we're giving you drainage, but it just settles your house, so you're sitting in your own cesspool. Yeah. And then when it rains, you step into it, and somebody, I'm glad you with somebody the other day because I went to, um, I live in Oniru, and then I went to Lake to wash my clothes. I like doing these things myself because as a social scientist, it allows me to figure out what's going in the environment. And we're driving down on that road that goes um, across DSF, where you go to Apache or Lisa, and it's all flooded. You can't tell where the potholes are and where they're not. And if you're lucky, you can't end in the name in trouble. You either swim out through the window or you're going to drown. So anyway, I was complaining. And I said, the big men right here, and they get into the same pool, and they get into their house and their gate, but they're all part of the same environment. Because even my own uh, solid waste, you picked it up one way or the other, as big as you. I said, no, it doesn't apply to get home. And then his uh, house boy carries him into the house. And I said, what about house boy? He cleans the car and he comes and touches his door. Eventually, he picks it up through epidemiology. You know, everybody is infected. Yes. He said, no, no, no. He goes out and washes it. He cleans his hand. He comes home. I said, you cannot insulate the person from the environment. We are all part of the same thing. It's really investment myopia that makes you think you can separate yourself. When I'm driving to work in the morning, and the beggars come and they're begging you and they're touching the handles. It reduces you to the same level. What are you going to do? Be a superman and break the door and jump out? You all have to open it and have to close it back. And you touch the same stuff. So in an instant, it reduces you to the same public health hazard as the person who is sitting outside. So it's a collective destiny. And it always surprises me why people don't think in terms of the connectedness that the social infrastructure uh, provides or imposes on all of us. So infrastructure is a big deal. So this is why we need to understand the role of society. It's a common denominator, it's a level, as much as we try to deny that. The nature of infrastructure is an elephant, as I've said, and so giving those to what are the prospects, how can we help, how do we integrate, and what are the challenges in trying to deal with infrastructure. 
Well, from uh, a humorous perspective, as a teacher, to engage the audience, you always have to find the humor in whatever you do. It doesn't matter if you're teaching tensor analysis, which the engineer knows is a very archaic part of uh, mathematics. Even Einstein used that to prove the theory of relativity. So, whether you're teaching tensor analysis, you've got to find the humor in that, otherwise the students won't pick it up. So, what's the humor in infrastructure? First, it's a talk. Uh, they call it talk in Washington, D.C. They call it Lulu in New York, in the New York legislature. And at home here, we understand all new works, housing, and transport, because that's where the contract is. From an incentive perspective, it's big. It's also where the money is, as the bankers know. And as the speaker said initially, uh, the director of research, it leads and lacks growth. It promotes growth, and also growth itself demands an increase in infrastructure. So it's everything for everybody. It's a really big deal. Infrastructure is the difference between this township in South Africa uh, and Johannesburg. If you're coming back to Johannesburg, Soweto, this is the view of downtown Johannesburg. This is also one of the townships in South Africa. It's the same country. The difference is in the environment and the infrastructure. This is one of the towns in South Africa. This is the toilet. This is the post apartheid. This is at least they're trying to improve it. So this is the post apartheid um, um, toilet that they've built in some of the squatter settlements. This is also one of the townships. This is our own very fellow. He's even talked about it. Original so far ahead. If you listen to that music, that is about infrastructure. The social infrastructure is lamenting how bad it is. I say, when are we going to go from Summerhead to Jefferhead? Since then, we're still Summerhead. So it seems like rolling, if we take one step forward, we go backwards. But we need, and in the conclusion of my paper, uh, which tells me about catchment, underwater catchment, is about technical people. You don't have a trunking or booster stations or even the water treatment. All you care is you want to get home, you turn the tap, the water comes out, and that that water is portable. Not the time that you finish and then you're scratching all over. Because that doesn't work. So it's the services that matter. If I don't get the services, I don't pay. If I don't pay, the Confucius should say, man on the ground, Nothing to fear. I'm already, I'm already falling. What are you going to disconnect my life? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so it's not a credible threat. So if we don't see the services, there's no cash flow. If there's no cash flow, you don't maintain. If you don't maintain it, the banks don't get their money paid back. So when we discuss the construction, you must discuss the supply of continuous supply of services. And so, most of the time, once the project is commissioned and the fancy engineering projects are over, they're thinking, that's where the problem begins. You want to make sure that the system operator is there in the morning. That the people back in the old days, never used to have this live maintenance van that go around the whole place. Now it's even easier with electronics and smart grids. You can pinpoint where it is actually so you can fix it. In the old days, people had to stay on the job 24-7 for it to work. So that is the highest part of infrastructure is sustainability. Okay, that's where management also becomes important at the incentives. Okay. This is, again, this is in South Africa, people were up in arms about infrastructure services. Okay. And that's so serious that the riot police, our president in Becky at the time was going around trying to find out what was happening in the municipalities. This is my local government. And it wasn't all my infrastructure, this is just a pacifier. But this is the kind of, this is the, in, in, front, in South Africa, they find all my infrastructure. Over here, we find all my party affiliation, rather than holding the government to account. And I wish this would show here how a big deal infrastructure is. It defines our livelihood and who we are. I don't care how many cars I have at home. As long as I step out of my house to open sewage, it doesn't matter. It reduces me to the same level. 
And I don't understand why people can't see things from that perspective. By the way, uh, this is just a quick digression, because that's how far I've come in my study of infrastructure. In the first, my foray into infrastructure was actually in 1995, 96, when President Buhari, coincidentally, was the chairman of PTS. And Nigeria was our boss with uh, Vision 2020, as some of you remember. And I asked myself, suppose somebody was to fund me, and I remember because I was doing the Zaina Qatar uh, problem and they provided that endless transition. They had all those local government uh, structures they were building at the time. So that was when I came back and I taught at the University of Jos until um, 1999 before I left for South Africa. So at the time, I, I had a back on this infrastructure study to say, what if the PTF may be used to produce infrastructure? And uh, of course, Terra Swami in Kenya, it's the same thing that this child is enjoying, but you can see the quality. So infrastructure also has a quality dimension. It's not just about it. And uh, this is Kime Amushing uh, uh, Lagos. And uh, this is uh, Pantry Bay, which we saw in those. And the difference between these two again is the quality of the infrastructure. This is said virus. So yeah, so as he said, as an engineer who might say, wait, that's what we do, we suffer. I'm suffering and smiling. He said it, and that's why the young man is smiling over here. So Fella has said it all, and almost like he's very visionary down the road. Everything he said is what's happening. The young man is smiling, and he's sitting in the middle of the garbage here as he's home. Um, nature, so that's the thing about the role of infrastructure. It should be clear to everybody that it's a very big deal. And therefore, I thank you once more for making it the uh, subject of your uh, discussion in this annual lecture. Okay. Um, first, given the nature of infrastructure, it requires an integrated approach in thinking about infrastructure, or what you call system analysis. Why? Because water, for instance, if you have water, but you can't access it, it's of no use to you. If you have schools, which is basic infrastructure, but there's no road to go to the school. In South Africa, when they were discussing about the constitutional requirements for water and schools and roads, and I had done some work for the Fiscal Commission about what is a school, what is a rural health, and the question was, what is a school if the children cannot get to school because the bridges are not there? If it's flooded, like it's over here, and surely you have to walk your child to school, otherwise if I end up in the gutter, and the flood will carry him or her away. So it's not enough to build this school without giving the access to that facility. So it's an integrated plan. You go and build a school, there's no road, there's no safety and security going to school, if the kids are going to get kidnapped going home, then I don't have a school because nobody's going to go there. If you have clinics and it's OS, as the Buddha has said, everything is out of stock. Now, what kind of dispensary is that? Nobody would go because it's simply an empty building. If you have schools without 